fielded some shit from a while ago. Yeah. Today, I want to look at, begin looking at the four pastoral epistles, the four pastoral letters. Pastoral, not in the sense that uh, their content is pastoral, although it's that, but pastoral in the sense that they were written to pastors. Three pastors, Timothy, Titus, and then Philemon, uh, three pastors. First of all, Timothy, uh, I don't know whether you've been noticing, but as we've been going through the epistles, how frequently Paul refers to Timothy. In fact, five of Paul's letters were co-authored with Timothy. Second Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and both, both of the Thessalonians letters were co-authored with Timothy. Um, he, in fact, was probably of all the people who worked with Paul, the one that Paul was closest to. He calls him his son, um, uh, his spiritual heir. Timothy was, had uh, a pagan father and he had a Jewish mother and grandmother. So his mother and grandmother were Christians, but his father was a pagan guy. Um, he was one of Paul's closest associates. Um, now, what's the circumstance here? When Paul went to Macedonia, you know, Thessalonica, which we heard about, you know, across to Philippi and then uh, uh, Thessalonica, uh, he left Timothy in charge of the congregation in Ephesus to combat the heretics there. And the heretics there were the ones we spoke about yesterday in Colossians. Now, this Gnostic heresy stuff, so I won't go into that again. Uh, that's the basic heresy. Um, these heretics used, were Jewish uh, Gnostics. They used the law, the Old Testament teaching, to promote Gnostic speculation, which aimed at achieving divine consciousness, you know, this level of divine consciousness, by the practice of celibacy and vegetarianism, which was supposed to lead to material prosperity. Isn't it funny? You become more and more spiritual in order to become more and more wealthy. Does it sound familiar? Um, you get the whole prosperity gospel, which is uh, uh, fashionable in certain parts of the church at the moment. This is a more ancient version of it. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. Um, now, um, there's three uh, reasons for writing this letter. And uh, if we can start off with you, please, uh, uh, Levi, chapter 1, verse 3, please, of Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. Right, -ho, that's the basic thing. Uh, he is to uh, uh, stay in Ephesus, the church there, and to uh, counteract the false teachers and their heresy. Um, now, in connection with that, Tim Paul sends Timothy to Ephesus to straighten out the mess in the congregation. It sounds a bit like a dysfunctional LCA congregation. There's problems about worship, there's problems about authority, um, uh, issues between ministry and laity, there's issues about the ordination of women, um, uh, all those kinds of questions. Okay? It might give us very much hope then. Uh, things, nothing changes. <coughs> um, now, Paul's charge, um, the advice is summarized then in chapter 3, 14 to 15. Please. Uh, I hope to come to you soon. I am writing you these instructions so that. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So he's writing so that people know how to conduct themselves in the household of God, the temple of God. So this is the what you need to do. And it's very practical stuff that he tells Timothy to do. And then lastly, he... Um, uh, wants to encourage Timothy in his work as a pastor in the church in um, 
Ephesus. Uh, Brenton, can you read the, uh, chapter 4, 12 to 16, please? Chapter 4, 12 to 16. Um, <clears throat> don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophet, prophetic sorry, message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Was it to 16? Yes. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. Doctrine is teaching. So that summarizes. Timothy, uh, <coughs> don't just uh, take great care in what you teach, you know, reading the scriptures, teaching the scriptures, but also in the way you live. Um, and model what you teach by how you live. <coughs> Notice the emphasis given there to the public reading of the scriptures and preaching and teaching from the scriptures. Now, the structure of the book is fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the first three chapters have to do with Paul's charge, Paul's... Uh, uh, task that he gives to Timothy to perform in Ephesus. Now, Timothy is a bit like an interim pastor in the LCA. I don't know whether you know anything about interim pastors. Let's say um, a congregation's run into trouble, irre uh, irreconcilable conflicts between pastor and congregation or within the congregation. A pastor leaves. Instead of calling a new pastor straight away, the LCA sends somebody an experienced pastor, an old pastor, to act as an interim pastor, yeah. to bang heads and to sort things out. Um, now, Timothy's a bit like that. He comes as interim pastor. He's got a great deal of experience. Um, uh, he uh, is closely associated with Paul. He's very skillful at dealing with p at pastoring people and dealing with uh, practical problems in a pastoral way. Um, What's he to do? Okay, you can see something of the scope of it here in the charge he's given. First of all, he is to refute heresy, uh, not politically, but with sound teaching. So he's to, to co counteract wrong teaching with right teaching. Um, secondly, he is to focus on the power of the gospel. That Spiritual power lies not in politics or in experience, but has to do with from the gospel. And the power of the gospel was shown in Paul's own conversion. Thirdly, he reminds Timothy and people in Corinth that they are called to wage spiritual warfare. Um, uh, and spiritual warfare has to do with conscience and faith. No, spiritual warfare is not out there, but in here. And it has to do with uh, maintaining uh, faith in Jesus and a good conscience that comes from faith in Jesus. Um, fourthly, and here, now we get to the practical stuff, uh, is uh, the importance of congregational prayer. Um, that the basic charge, charge task of the church is to pray not just for themselves but to pray for all people including the emperor Nero who's already then persecuting Christians and all human beings so to pray for the world as a very important part of their worship then he speaks about the behavior both of men and of women in worship and particularly he targets our uh, uh, Men, because of their anger and quarrelling and falling out with each other, and women who wanted to be teachers. Um, then he talks about the qualification of a bishop and deacon. Now, a bishop's not what we think a bishop is. A bishop is a presiding pastor, head pastor, uh, the superintendent, the pastor in charge. So, and a deacon is an assistant. 
So uh, what are the qualifications for, for ordaining somebody as a bishop, as a deacon? And then um, uh, the character of the church as the household of God. And then uh, that's geared towards the congregation as a whole. And then you get uh, uh, the task of Timothy as a pastor in Ephesus. Um, now, how is he to treat the various groups that are in conflict with each other in the community? Now, the general principle that Paul enunciates is that Timothy, even though he's a young guy, is to treat everybody as if they were family. Do you get the basic principle? You treat everybody as if they are family. <coughs> young men, with brothers, old men, fathers, old women as mothers, uh, uh, younger Christian women as sisters, and the children in the congregation as children. Right? So to treat them as family. That's that unity stuff. That's that unity stuff. And uh, so, um, and then he focuses on three areas. First of all, the treatment of widows. I don't know whether you realize that widows in the ancient world and still in many parts of the world like India basically are the most vulnerable, disadvantaged people in the community. If you don't have any welfare system, once a woman loses her husband and if she hasn't got a son, she's got no means of support. So the treatment of widows. And then there's the treatment of uh, it's someone who is an elder, a pastor. Okay? How do you treat your pastor? And lastly, the behavior of slaves. As you can imagine, when, when slaves became Christians, uh, this created tensions between them and their masters, particularly if their masters were Christians. Well, it's even more with Christians and non-Christians yeah. because they are brothers and sisters in Christ and yet they still remain slaves. Can you see the, there's the issue there? Um, and then lastly, and it's, uh, this is more general, he focuses on the whole issue of money. Uh, the whole issue of money. He warns against riches, not riches in itself, but the love of money, which is the root of all evil. Now, money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Um, all evil is the literal, uh, I think, many kinds understood. And then there's talk there about behavior of Timothy again as pastor. Uh, and then advice for the uh, given to the wealthy. If God gives you a lot, then you've got to use your money for the benefit for, to do God's work. Yes? I was just thinking, I guess uh, money could be thought of as not just literal money, but just wealth. Wealth, having things. Yes. Yes. riches, resources, yeah. property, possessions, yes. And then you have a concluding admonition and blessing. Now, um, uh, two of the uh, co two common words that you'll find across all these pastoral letters are, in our translation, the adjective sound, which means healthy or healing. Sound doctrine. Now, for us, sound doctrine sounds like right doctrine, and that's not wrong, but it means literally healing doctrine, healthy doctrine. Now, the basic, it's medical language, it's a medical term. Sound doctrine is doctrine that heals the conscience. <coughs> now, what's the reverse? What does heresy do? What does false teaching do? Harm. It harms, it makes you spiritually sick instead of spiritually healthy. So, uh, so number one, Paul emphasizes the importance of healing teaching, sound teaching, um, based on the gospel. Joshua, can you read chapter 8, no, I mean not chapter 8, chapter 1, 8 to 17. And notice here, as he reads this, the connection between law and gospel in this. Um, We'll read um, up to verse 11, since time's short. Yep. Now we know that the law is good, if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, 
but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. To, um, and go back right at the beginning uh, to uh, verse 5. Yes. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Right, so notice the em emphasis there on a <coughs> clear conscience. Now, what is healing doctrine? Healing doctrine is, healing teaching is teaching that distinguishes rightly between law and gospel in order to give a clear conscience which comes from faith and leads to love. You can only love properly if you have a good conscience. So healing doctrine is using both law and gospel in the right way. By the way, here you get one of the prohibitions of or, or connection uh, passages in the New Testament that uh, uh, deals with homosexuality. Did you pick it up? Um, that's one of the big uh, issues at the moment here. Verse 10. Can you read again, Joshua, verse 10? Because you've got the uh, very good translation there. Um, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary. Okay, sodomites. Um, the NIV ver is very prissy and has perverts, uh, which is not wrong, but it means sexual perverts. Not, it's not sexual perverts generally, but it has to do with sodomites. Now, sodomy is um, male uh, intercourse, anal intercourse of a man with another man. The term is, that's used in Greek here is somebody who lies with a man as if a woman. Um, so, someone who is sexual intercourse with a male person. Uh, sodomites. Okay. The second uh, uh, word that is used frequently in... Uh, yes, it's from Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, is that, uh, in these letters is the term godliness, um, uh, which is... Uh, in uh, Greek, eusebia, eusebia, from which you get the very ch uh, the f famous church is Eusebius. Now, sebia is reverence, devotion. Eusebia is good reverence, right reverence, right devotion. So, um, uh, godly, this is usually translated as godliness. The modern term would be spirituality. Mm. Okay? So, the importance of spirituality. Um, right devotion, which is in, in tune with and comes from the oi angelion, no, same thing, the gospel. Um, next, please. Garth, can you read about the value of godliness? The value of um, spirituality, the spiritual life. Chapter 4, 7 to 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for, for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Right, uh, train yourself in godliness. Exercise godliness, exercise spirituality. You know, um, this is a very important passage for our spiritual life because it's the command, if you like, it's the mandate for your devotional life. It's not something that happens automatically, just as you've got to train in order to become a good athlete. Um, so uh, you need discipline, um, you need uh, to exercise it in order to be, uh, um, uh, grow in spirituality. And um, this is some value for the present life, but uh, it's, it has, it's not just physical value, but it has value for the present life and the life to come. Yes, please, Garth. So I take it when Luther perceived that exercise being reading the word, taking the sacraments, all that jazz? Yes. 
So it has to do both with involvement in public worship and your devotional life of meditation and prayer. Yes? And the physical training here is an image of as in like the Olympic. Olympic. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an athletic Im, uh, imagery here. Yeah. Hello? Um, you're a so the picture here is an athlete. Okay. Uh, Kate, in order to become a spiritual athlete, you've got to train yourself in godliness. Yes? Um, he, uh, at one point, he says, um, do not be hasty to lay hands. Um, yes. On Very simple. What? Um, he means uh, 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 laying on hands in these letters has to do with ordination. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, there's always a danger if you ordain somebody who's a recent convert. Mm -hmm. Before they're founded in the faith because they're not founded strongly enough that Satan will uh, um, blow up their pride and will bring about a spectacular fall. Now if there's something that I've learned in the times that I've been here involved is that wherever a recent convert has been ordained, uh, that person's run into trouble. So uh, just uh, you've got to test somebody before you ordain them and that's partly what we're doing here in, for all of you is testing you. Um, <coughs> Uh, preparing you in such a way that you will not be vulnerable to there's, attack. There's a lot of colleges, Bible colleges out there who do very short courses. That's right, there for yes. Ordination. And they prefer to ordain recent converts because they're full of zeal for the Lord. Uh, they are the most enthusiastic and it's true. Um, but uh, if you look at the histories of these, the fallout rate is spectacular. And the seeds are so much fat soil or shallow soil. Yes, shallow soil. It's, out it's burn. You, it, it's the burnout is very, very quick. Yes. I oh, just, as a matter of interest. Yes. Those ones that leave is that because they come both the other way, where they get crushed? And it's a cro there's a whole <laughs> spectrum stuff. Some it's it's a matter of pride. The other one, it's burnout, and most commonly it's just being crushed, overwhelmed. Um, because they don't have solid foundations to draw from, it, they do their ministry out of themselves rather than out of Christ and His Spirit. Yes? Um, is there any, uh, I guess, record or anything that says sort of, ha I don't know, I guess, um, I'm thinking of do not neglect your gift. Do not neglect your gift. I'll have a look at that. I'll have a look at that. I'll have a look at that. Um, that's uh, in, in Second Timothy, I think. Now, what are the qualifications for a pastor? Let's go to you, Stephen. And as Stephen reads this, chapter 3, 1 to 13, uh, we won't look at... Yeah, yeah, we'll, uh, we won't go to a, um, 13, uh, but we'll just do for a, um, a pastor, a bishop, 1 to 7. And have a look at and see if there's anything that strikes you about the list of qualifications for the ordination of somebody as a pastor and as a head pastor. Please read. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer... That's a bishop. ...he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome but a love, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Can you see the recent convert? That's what we're talking about. Uh, what strikes you about that list of qualifications, Stephen? The importance of, for me, it's the importance of being able to manage your own family so that you can manage God's family. Okay. There's a lot of self-control there. And 
Notice that there's very little there about what we emphasize these days. There's nothing about spiritual gifts. Do you see? There's nothing there. Most of this is not spiritual stuff. It all has to do with good character. There's only one spiritual thing there, and that is that he is able to teach. Not able to teach excellently, though. No, but able to teach. And, and the Greek word there is very interesting because it's apt to teach and it has a double sense. That person is teachable and therefore able to teach. You can only teach if you are ready to be taught. Be taught and as long as you are still being taught. I don't, it's, it's a lovely expression. And the older I get in the ministry, the more I see how important that is. Some people are able to teach, but they are unteachable. Or uh, they are taught for a while in seminary and then they won't be taught anymore after that. They don't stop learning. Um, so it's basically the emphasis here is on good character and very practical things. And by those criteria, all of you are qualified, I think. Um, uh, it's not a very high bar. Uh, now, notice too... Um, that it's in First Timothy that you get a passage which has been very important for the debate over the ordination of women. Um, can you please read, uh, who's next? Yes, Tony. Chapter 2, 11 to 12, which is the key passage. Chapter 2, 11 to 12. A woman should learn in quiet and full submission. I do not permit a woman, woman to teach or to have authority over man. She must be silent. Okay, woman must learn or must be a disciple in quietness and in subordination. So, women must be disciples, but they can't be teachers. That's in place. To men. Well, if, then it's also, yes. It's in the church. Yes. What? Is this a fairly late letter? Yes. So, yeah, this is in, is this in... Earlier letters and whatnot. Well, it's in in First Corinthians chapter fourteen, almost yeah. exactly the same. Because it's just interesting to, to try and work out where he's. I suppose because he was a Jew, he's brought it from Judaism over to Christianity. The, oh, God has. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm just saying. Yeah, there is. It says, but but um, there's one aspect. There's a couple of aspects here which are, are a anti, which are not Jewish. In the same passage, uh, in the synagogue, only men prayed, women didn't pray. He says women must pray. Okay. Um, according to rabbinical tradition, women cannot be disciples. So at two points, he goes against Judaism. He says, Christian women, um, there's three things that are astonishing here. Christian women, number one, are to join together with men in praying in the congregation. Secondly, all Christian women are e disciples, just as men are disciples. Thirdly, anything to do with menstruation, childbirth, doesn't disqualify a woman from participation in salvation, say, Holy Communion. Yeah. So, uh, in that way, he uh, uh, goes beyond Judaism, but when it comes to women as teachers, uh, he says no. Does he have any why, apart from obviously bad and was born first and he, but it's kind of like... Yes. Uh, he, going, he doesn't, obviously there wouldn't be such a debate if he, yes. if he went into it more depth. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, if you want to look at the full argument, you've got to go to 1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 38. And the bottom line is there, he says, I have this as a command of the Lord. Um, but it has to do with the whole teaching of headship and subordination that we touched on uh, yes, yesterday. Can I just draw the line there? Because we don't, I, I'm quite happy to discuss it, but we've got a lot to cover. Uh, uh, the duties of a pastor. Okay, uh, Stephen, can you take both of those? What's, what's a pastor called to do? <coughs> Two, one to five. Um, the importance of prayer I urge, I urge you then first of all that requests prayers intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and for all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness this is good and pleases God our Saviour 
who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We'll stop there. Okay. Uh, to lead the community in prayer. Secondly, um, chapter 4, 11 to 13. Oh, we had a look at that. The reading of scriptures, teaching, etc. And lastly, the need of a pastor to set a good example to everyone. We've also read that. Very straightforward. By the way, if you want to know what being a pastor is, the first pastoral handbooks ever written were 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus. Now, uh, when you do pastoral theology, you'll find out that uh, 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 Dr. Pfeiffer and Pastor Peach will be going back again and again to these books. Uh, they are foundational for pastoral work. Now, much later um, than this, or somewhat later than this, uh, the first letter written around about 60 AD. Now, um, this is probably the last letter that Paul ever wrote. And he writes this knowing that he is going to die. He faces death and it's a letter of farewell to Timothy, who is his closest um, pastor, fellow pastor. So Paul wrote this letter in prison in Rome just before he was ex executed, 67 AD, to Timothy in Ephesus. He's in the same place still. Even though no one supported him in his trial, he was able to make a powerful defense of the gospel in front of the Roman court. But he was there alone. No one stood by his side and helped him defend himself. He sensed his end was near and so asked Timothy to come with Mark, Mark John, the writer of the gospel, to come and visit him in Rome. But at the same time, he was worried about the spread of the Gnostic heresy, which we heard about in Colossae, Laodicea, Ephesus, and the general spread in that province of Asia. Yes? Two questions, yes. quick ones. Yes. Um, the court, was that the Senate or was that a different? Uh, we don't know. Don't uh, know. It, it was a court that was uh, under uh, the emperor's control, so it's not, it, it wasn't a Senate court, but it was an imperial court, uh, un, uh, governed by imperial magistrates. Okay. And, uh, yes. The other question was, he was a Roman citizen, right? Yes. So when he was executed, it was something like beheading? Right? It was beheading. He couldn't, be, he couldn't be humiliated in any way, like yeah. crucifixion or dismembering, or he couldn't be chastised. He couldn't or be whipped. in the Colosseum or something. Yeah, he couldn't he was, be used as lion bait. Yeah, okay. Okay? He was a Roman citizen. Um, it had to be nice and clean. Yeah. <laughs> Chop your head off. Um, now... Uh, what's the purpose of the letter? Um, and the situation here makes it quite clear. And you can see how it all comes out of that, uh, the, the, the fact that Paul is going to die very shortly. And so this is his farewell letter. Number one, he asked Timothy to come and visit him before his death, if possible. Um, he encouraged Timothy to accept suffering like Paul as a minister of the gospel. And there's something very interesting he says here because he says as a pastor, when he was ordained, he was given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of power and love and sound-mindedness. Now, the power of the Spirit is to be shown in the endurance of suffering. Now, that's most unexpected. So he doesn't say, use the power of the Spirit in order to become a super evangelist. But the power of the Spirit is shown in the endurance of suffering for the sake of the gospel together with Paul. Thirdly, he urges Timothy to remain faithful to the apostolic doctrine, apostolic teaching, and to ensure that he passed on that teaching to other pastors. So there's a chain of um, tradition. What Paul received from Jesus... He passes on to Timothy, who's to pass on to the people that he trains and ordains to be teachers, pastors. Now, you are at the tail end of that chain of tradition. Now, uh, it's what I've received and what's now being passed on to you. Lastly, he warns against the dangers of the heresy 
uh, that Gnostic heresy. The structure of the letter um, starts off with a typical greeting and thanksgiving for Timothy's faith, the faith that he inherited from his grandmother and his mother. So it's a faith, notice there the reference to the women, how important they were in his life. Now he received his faith, grandmother, mother, Paul, uh, 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 now, uh, and then uh, Timothy. So gives thanksgiving for that. And then you have Paul's instruction to Timothy. He's to imitate Paul's boldness in accepting suffering. He's to imitate Paul's faithfulness in teaching. He's to um, refute those who are heretics. Heretics who teach false doctrine or wrong doctrine. He's to avoid those who are libertines. The antinomian gospel reductionists. Who re libertine is a person who says, um, we're freed from the condemnation of the law, therefore we're free to do whatever we yeah. want. That's the libertines. That's our, our, that our, our license. And in contrast to that, uh, he's to imitate Paul's life as a teacher of the scriptures. Um, and remember, scriptures here is Old Testament scriptures. So his task is to teach, 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 teach the scriptures. Um, and uh, he's to persist in preaching whether people listen or don't listen, whether it, it's fashionable or unfashionable. Whatever happens, he's to preach the gospel in season, out of season. That's his task um, uh, as a pastor. And then you get the conclusion of the letter. You get Paul's confidence in the face of martyrdom. He says, I've fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. And now the reward, the end of the race is going to come and the crown of righteousness will be given to me. So Paul's confidence in the face of his imminent death. Then he mentions some personal matters to Timothy and then the final greetings and the blessing. Now, David, since you raised this question, can we have a look at the first theme here? Chapter 1, 6 to 7, please. Chapter 1, 6 to 7 of Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self discipline. And so that's what he was talking about in the last book. That's what he's talking about in the last book, about laying on of hands. And he had hands laid on with the word of, uh, that was spoken to him. It's not just Paul, but the whole body of elders, all pastors. Like, um, if at the end of the year when you go to ordination, it's not just Mike Simmel who ordains, but the whole pastorate. There's a whole group of pastors that ordain into the ministry. So it has to do with ordination. And at ordination... Um, what did Timothy receive? What's the charisma he received? He received the, sp the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that empowered him, the Spirit that empowered him to love, the Spirit that empowered him to exercise self-control, self-discipline. But he would have already had the Holy Spirit. So That's right. <laughs> but you, can, you, have, you can't... And, and it, it, you know, Paul says, fan into flame thee the gift that you have. You don't just receive the Holy Spirit at one point, you receive it continually. continually and for different purposes. So the same Spirit, but for different purposes. Um, okay? uh, a very important, if you look at the rite of ordination, a very important part of the rite of ordination is the, the gift of the Holy Spirit to the person who's going to go into ministry because the only way you can do the work of Jesus, supernatural work, is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hence the importance of the gift of the Spirit in ordination. Then we have the qualifications of a pastor. They're basically the same as in um, our earlier letter, but let's have a look at them. Um, chapter 2, 20 to 26. Could you please read? Does that mean? No, Levi. No, Levi. Oh. The Levite. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, 
but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some are for ignoble. If a man clean, cleanses himself for the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, made useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach... Notice, able to teach again, the Lord's servant, the pastor. Not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to, to do his will. Notice, first of all, the pastor, uh, what's important is your behaviour, your life, modelling the faith. Secondly, what's important is that you don't go into <coughs> stupid arguments and, and uh, be a polemical, um, uh, contentious kind that's, of person, really a quarrelsome person. And then thirdly, the importance of teaching and teaching not just right doctrine but using uh, teaching to correct <coughs> false doctrine in a gentle way lastly he mentions not being resentful now why not resentful because a pastor cops a lot of so and so and it's quite unfair it's very difficult to be a pastor and not to resent we will five year course for minimal pay you get people on hundreds of thousands yes. of dollars doing the same years we do you got the idea yes Dylan. <laughs> so, no, it's just that resentful. Is yes. What, what I was going to say, what is it resentful of that you've just uh, Resentful of the, the deal. Yeah. Uh, the whole deal. No, it's not just the money. It has to do with uh, the fact that you're a scapegoat for other people. Um, people dump on you. Um, uh, you're caught in the crossfire. People blame you for stuff that you don't do. Um, if things go right, People assume, won't thank you, but as soon as something goes wrong, you get blamed. It's all, all that kind of stuff. Pretty normal, yes. We heard the example of Paul yesterday. He didn't take a salary uh, from this congregation. And then remember, uh, they then said, oh, that's because he can't preach any good. He's not worth, <laughs> he's not, he's not worth the money. Uh, okay, the use of the Old Testament in teaching and preaching, the use of the scriptures... Um, can you read that section about um, uh, those three passages, please, Dylan? Chapter <coughs> 2, verse 15, first of all. Uh, 2, verse 15. Here we are. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, literally in Greek, it's not who handles the word of truth, but who divides the word of truth. Now it's at, from that passage that you get the Lutheran teaching about the division, the distinction between law and gospel. It has that double sense. You handle the word of truth in the right way and you handle it in the right way if you distinguish rightly, you divide it rightly, um, law and gospel. Next passage please. Three, but notice that because that's where that term comes from in our tradition. 3.14 through to the end of the chapter. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay. Um, using the scriptures to make people wise for salvation. Very important verse there, 18. All scripture is God-breathed. The Greek is God-spirited or God-spiriting. <sighs> Now, there's two senses here. Scripture, the Word of God, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it also <coughs> inspires, breathes the Holy Spirit into us. Can I repeat that again? The Scriptures are not only inspired by 
God's Spirit, but they inspire God's Spirit. They breathe God's Spirit into us. And that's where the power lies, to use the Scriptures to, for spiritual purposes. Lastly, and I'll have the question then, chapter 4, 1 to 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. That'll do. And next, uh, faithfulness and transmitting apostolic teaching. Josh, can you read chapter 2, 1 to 2? We'll just take that one passage there. You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. And what you've heard, pass on to others, faithful teachers. Um, so... You as a pastor prepare other pastors and hand on the teaching that you've received to them. Lastly, um, the importance of accepting suffering for the sake of the gospel. One of the things that comes together with being a minister of the gospel and preaching the gospel is the uh, abuse that you cop from people. Garth, can you read chapter uh, 1, 8 to 12? So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, he has destroyed death and has brought life and immorality. Immortality, not immorality. <laughs> <laughs> For some. Yeah. <laughs> to light, to light through the gospel. And this gospel I have appointed a herald and, and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Now I am not ashamed because I know who I have, have believed and am convinced. That he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Um, instead of being able to guard what I have entrusted to him, but what has been entrusted to me, um, that's not a good translation. What? <coughs> so, uh, 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 you are faithful in suffering. Why do you ha not have to be ashamed? Because the gospel is powerful. It brings life and immortality to light. You don't have to be ashamed because uh, it, nothing depends on you. Everything depends on Jesus. He's convinced that he, uh, Jesus is able to keep him faithful right to the end. Um, so uh, he doesn't have to be defensive and try and protect the gospel as if it's going to be destroyed. He can be bold in preaching, teaching the gospel because... Uh, 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 its preservation depends on Jesus. Yes, a couple of questions. Yes, David first. Um, something that uh, I was thinking about the other day to do with um, uh, uh, all scripture being God breathed. Yes. Um, and well, the gospel having power, I guess, is um, I've heard like three, three sermons from different pastors at different. Lutheran churches in like two weeks the yes. pastor is telling everyone to um, that your actions speak louder than words yes. and I was thinking well when it comes to our actions, our actions might speak louder than our words but mm -hmm. when we speak God's word, his word will speak louder than our actions, actions. Yeah. indeed yeah. yes, true okay. mm -hmm. Tony I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to be pretty negative <laughs> 
You're going to be pretty negative. Good. Yes. yes. Because <laughs> the statement you were talking about, pastors, there's some very, and, and to do with congregations and being, um, it is hard being a pastor. Yes. <laughs> but I think that there are some very pious congregational members who. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, don't take it one-sidedly, because when we come well, to, you know, for, for Peter, he'll say that it's, uh, what's, what's the deal in being a Christian mm, mm, in the world? Mm. You're, going to, you're going to cop the rough end of the stick. Yep, yep. There's, no, there's no guarantee for a cushy existence. Thank you. Uh, you. Just as Christ is persecuted, so all those who are dis uh, ministers of Christ will be persecuted, and so too will all disciples of Christ. But notice here... Well, you, you, you don't want to generalise. Here Paul is speaking not to a congregational member, he's speaking to? To a pastor. He's speaking to a pastor. And Timothy's a, a timid guy. He's not your aggressive, go-getting, kind of thick-skinned person. It's obvious he's very, very sensitive. Now what's the problem if you're a very sensitive person, easily hurt? Well, you don't go forward. You, know. you don't go forward. Not only that, but you avoid... What? Avoid conflict, you avoid conflict, you avoid confrontation, you want to appease, you want to, you want to paper things over, you want to smooth things out, right? Okay. right. And that's the kind, that's what makes him a good pastor, mm -hmm. is because he's so sensitive mm -hmm. and he's timid, he's not their boots and all. Right. Um, and so Paul reminds him that God didn't give him a spirit of timidity when he was ordained, but what kind of spirit did he give him? A power of of power and sound-mindedness. Power and love. Power by itself would be wrong because power would be going boots and all. But power which is exercised in love and which is sound-mindedness. The ability to think and see things clearly. Right? All right. Okay? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so uh, uh, very important uh, that that we don't take things just one side of the story. Yes? I've actually, this is making sense to me now, the spirit of um, sound mindedness for the pastoral ministry, I've always sort of thought, well, all Christians are given that yeah. as well, but particularly what you said before about the different purposes and for being a pastor and leading yes. it is amazing in a meeting or some sort of gathering where there's conflict yes. and there's, there's, there's problems and no one sees the solution. The number of times I've seen pastors quietly and gently just yeah. cut the answer that yes. because they see it clearly. And you've also probably seen the reverse where the pastor's made bad worse because he hasn't been sound-minded. Actually that word sound-mindedness which is usually translated as self-discipline or self-control is actually sound-mindedness uh, is, is a, a, another medical term like uh, sound-healthy um, which means not just healthy thinking, but also healthy feeling. I don't, um, uh, because you can be misled by your feelings, as well as thinking. So the ability to think clearly, but also to feel clearly, and to feel what's going on. Because quite often the problem is, in any conflict situation, what people say is ne not really what they mean and what's going on there. You've got to see behind words to what's the, the, the deeper level of things and to be able to feel what's going on as well as be able to see what's going on. And that's, that's really good discernment, to, to be able to discern that. It's, it's, it's very rare and it's the fact that uh, Paul says it's a gift of the Spirit means that on the deepest level it's not something that comes naturally. No, it it's supernatural gift. It comes from the Holy Spirit. True sound-mindedness, spiritual sound-mindedness that I was talking about, is supernatural, is a gift of the Spirit. And if it's a gift of the Spirit, it's something you can pray for. Whatever is promised to the Spirit, uh, if you're called to be ministry, then you can pray for the Holy Spirit to empower you to do what you're called to do. If you're called to be a pastor, then you can pray for the Holy Spirit to help you to love people who are rather unlovable. Thirdly, if sound-mindedness has been promised to somebody at, uh, like uh, in, as a pastor, it means that you can pray for this gift. 
in a contentious, difficult situation, and you know that God will give it to you because it's guaranteed to you in your ordination. So it's not just given once in ordination, but the fact that it's given in ordination means to go back to what you said. This is something that you can pray for. And it's the kind of thing that I pray for almost every day as a pastor. But it doesn't mean, don't read the other side of it, it doesn't mean that any lay person can't pray for yes. power yeah. to perform your vocation. Yeah. Uh, uh, love, because your vocation, wherever you are, you're called to love people, to love the unlovable, and also you can pray for sound-mindedness, etc. Now, we'll have to do a bit of racing to get through the course. I remind you that the last day will be also the last test. <laughs>